All right, let's stand with us and turn to 240, Lily of the Valley. <laughs> to my soul, the lily of the valley, and him alone I sing, all I need to cleanse and make me fully whole, in sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay, he tells me every care on him to roll, he's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. blessings of life that you've given us. We thank you for everyone that's here tonight, and we pray that each one will receive a blessing uh, from your word. We pray that as Roberto preaches, he'll have the power of God upon him, and that uh, as he preaches, we will feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. Our hearts will be drawn closer to you. Forgive us of our sins, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, you may be seated. Good to see everybody back tonight in the house of the Lord. Let's turn over to number 55. Number 55. When the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise And the glory of his resurrection share When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder
song is called The Purpose of the Church. I'll get it one of these times. <clears throat> Churches are dying all around us. Bibles tonight, turn with me to the book of Nahum, chapter 1. 
Um, it's right before the book of Habakkuk, if it helps. Um, and this is actually a sermon that was a request. Um, and it was really interesting, really, to dig into this book. Um, it's a minor prophet, and I have to say I haven't really dug into it before for a sermon series or anything like that. And um, it was really interesting to do so. Um, and the first, we're really going to be talking about the whole book. I know I just put Nahum chapter 1, and I think also um, if you go to, there's another part in the outline where the verses are wrong, but I'll, when we get there, I'll let y'all know. Um, but I want to read all the way to verse 7 of Nahum chapter 1, and then we'll start. Uh, really, the first chapter is only 15 verses, and I'm going to be referencing what goes on in the other uh, two chapters as well. Um, as we go along tonight, but it says this in Nahum chapter 1 verse 1. It says, The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and he will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind, and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein, who can stand before his indignation, and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger. His fury is poured out, like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us. I thank you for your word, and Lord, as we now break it open, Lord, to preach out of it, I pray, Lord, that it will be a blessing to the hearers. I pray, Lord, that you will speak through me. And um, God, I just pray, Lord, that your word be spoken here tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So I wanted to kind of do a little bit of background on, on Nahum just for, because I know this is really an interesting book in that we get a lot of parallels. And you'll see as we go along tonight, I am going to be referencing another more famous minor prophet. Um, and if you see the city that's being referenced here, I think you can pretty much tell who it is. Um, the certain guy that got eaten by the fish. Um, so I will be referencing Jonah um, quite a bit because this book really goes hand in hand with the book of Jonah. Um, really, Nahum ministered during what we know as the divided kingdom. Israel, at the point where we get to his ministry, had been taken captive. And you know, Judah, the southern kingdom, stood alone. But God doesn't necessarily, with Nahum, is kind of interesting because just as he does with Jonah, instead of preaching to God's people, quote unquote, his people, he decides to turn and preach to a heathen city that, for all accounts, deserved destruction, just like Jonah thought they righteously did. And when Nahum is writing this and when God gives him this message, this vision, we see that it is about a hundred years after Jonah preaches in the city. Jonah went, and as we know the story, he tried to run away from God and God turned him back. Um, and even after God turns him back, if you go to the last chapter of the book of Jonah, it kind of leaves it open-ended. And we talked about that a couple weeks, about a year and a half ago when we went through the book of Jonah, that Jonah is kind of left open-ended. And we get a lot of the answers from Jonah here in the book of Nahum. Because Nahum deals with Nineveh again, but this time we see that it is a Nineveh that has now heard the truth of Almighty God. It's not like in the days of Jonah where they had not really known who God was and Jonah was proclaiming the message. And by the way, if you look at Jonah and if you look at Nahum, really the message of both of these books is exactly the same as John the Baptist's message, which was repent. That's really the message where of Jonah and also of our book tonight, Nahum. So Nahum brings the message, this message, a uh, hundred years after Jonah's revival in the city of Nineveh. And we saw that the revival was complete all the way up to the king. We saw that 
There was sackcloth and ashes and all of, all types of mourning being done. They were truly repentant for what they had done. But fast forward a hundred years later, and Nineveh had completely forgotten about what message Jonah had brought to them. They had completely forgotten everything that Jonah had preached to them. And in a way, it's kind of sad, but Jonah kind of is about to get his wish. Remember, he went after he preached in the city. And he goes up to the mountain and sits there and waits for God to destroy them. And I'm sad to say, if you go towards, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler alert for the rest of the book of Nam, because we won't be able to cover it. Um, Nineveh is utterly destroyed. But God uses another army to come into the city. And not only does it get destroyed, but we see that it gets looted. And this was one of the, the crowning cities of civilization at this time. It was one of the, the peaks of civilization and one of the centers of the world at this time. And it is left utterly desolate by the time you go to uh, Nahum chapter 3. But if you look at the book, especially the seven verses that I've read, and it's really, um, if you go through the rest, and we'll kind of touch on the rest of this chapter, we really see that it, there is a very clear message in the book of Nahum. Look at verse 2 with me. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Then look at verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the, will, in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are, and the dust, are the dust of his feet. So when we get to this book, we really get to this answer and this question, who is God? If you've noticed, I've kind of been, uh, the last few sermons I've done, I've kind of just placed questions and we've kind of answered the questions. And the question that Nahum answers is this, who is God? And it's really answered by the title of tonight's sermon. God is a gracious revenger. Now, what does that mean? God is a gracious revenger. The first thing we see is verse 2, where he is called a revenger. We don't see the gracious part just yet. But because it's an adjective, I had to put it before. But let's see what makes God a revenger. That word is an interesting one because it doesn't mean that God just, deals with things just right then and there. He shows grace. He shows mercy. And he gives time. And he gives time. He gave time to Nineveh, and they were very undeserving of it. He sent Jonah to them. They were very undeserving of it. And now he sends Nahum to them, and they are undeserving of that. But God still gives to them an opportunity. Now, what does it mean that when God, when it says that God is a revenger? Number one, it is that this, God is not one who just lets evil sit idly by. You know, I think a lot of people, and I, I mentioned this in the series that I uh, preached on hell, that people believe that there is a, you can just kick it down the road. You can just kick the consequences down the road. And people spend all of their life kicking the consequences down the road. And there is one point that you get to, everyone gets to, that there is no more kicking the can down the road. There's a point where you have to deal with the issue. And there's a point where I had a pastor that used to say, you know, he used to say, and one day it's just too late. One day it's too late. But God gives revenge. And what that means is that here in verse uh, 17 of Luke 8, it says this, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither is anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. You know, God knows everything. Uh, uh, this idea that we can hide anything from God is kind of interesting to me because if you look at who God is, God is somebody that knows everything. He knew that Nineveh had received a great opportunity and a hundred years later, about a few generations removed from this great opportunity to receive grace, to not be utterly wiped off the face of the map, they went back to their old ways. Kind of similar to what Israel was doing at this time. If you know the history of Israel, at this time of the divided kingdom, they had king after king after king. And some of the kings, the majority of them, 
would not want to go after the ways of the Lord. They wanted to do, as the Bible says, what was right in their own eyes. The same with Nineveh. And I think this is why Nineveh is, gets two books dedicated to it. Because Nineveh, when you look at it, 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 all of humanity is exactly the same. You know? We either, we have a choice every single day of our lives. We either we do what is right in our own eyes or we do what is right in the Lord's eyes. And a lot of the time, sometimes maybe, we will do what God wants us to do. Israel experienced that and experienced great years with great kings like Josiah, to name one, and a few others that did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But many times they would fall by the wayside and they would cry out to the Lord and God would have to redeem them. And again and again and again, as we see throughout the New, or actually the Old Testament. You know, God takes revenge because he is the only one that is truly just to do so. Romans 12, verse 19 tells us, Dearly beloved, avenge not thyselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You know, it is not up to us, and I've always, I've always said this, that if we take revenge, we can. We have all the opportunity to take revenge when something happens to us. But God does it so much better than we can. Amen, bro. That's right. God does it so much better than we can. And I'll tell you this. There, is, there are certain moments that I have seen, you know, where I just sit there and I pray. Yeah. And God just works on my behalf. Amen. And he does that for all believers. You know, when something happens and it was unjust and it was something that we just didn't want, just pray. Let God handle it. It might take a while. That's, that's where we get into trouble sometimes is because we're a little impatient. Mm. But if you give God time, he will deal with it for you. And he'll deal with it much better than we can. God takes revenge for he's the only one just to do so. And I want to look at this thought. Who does God avenge? Uh, he avenged, number one, he avenges believers. Revelation chapter 6 tells us in verse 9, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of soul, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? These are the martyrs that had died for the cause of Christ, and they were crying out to the Lord, asking him, How long is it going to take for you to actually deal with this? Now, I don't see anything wrong with that asking because it was, they knew God was going to deal with it. They were just wondering how long it's going to take. You know, we human beings are very impatient things. And when you look at how God deals with things sometimes in the great span of the universe and throughout all time, sometimes it can be hard to wait on him. But God avenges us and he works on our behalf. He goes for us and goes ahead of us. Not only that, but God, we see that he avenged his own son. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, it says, Wherefore, we know this passage, it says, Wherefore God has also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You know, Christ was mistreated and unjustly killed, but God, after that event, exalt, exalts Christ so that every knee will bow before him. So what is this idea that God is the revenger, and how does that carry into Nam chapter 1? Well, it's really simple. God will have his will and his way no matter who it is. Whether that is with the nation of Israel, God's people, or whether that is with the wicked, wicked city of Nineveh. That is why I think that Nineveh is there and is dedicated not just one book of Jonah, but is dedicated two whole books about it because it shows us a, the, God's people who should have been the most pure, the most amazing people, should have been a beacon of light to the world. And then we have a great contrast with Nineveh, the most wicked, vile city you could possibly imagine. And both of them, God deals with the exact same way. With the book of Jonah, he gives them an opportunity. He proclaims the message. Jonah goes to proclaim the message. And 
They do something that Jonah did not expect. They actually took it to heart. And boy, was he mad. <laughs> and boy, was he mad. But now, a hundred years later, and here's, and this is what, when I was reading through the book of Nahum, and I, and I kept coming across this idea of, you know, a hundred years later, they went back to their old ways. You know, when we don't carry on the gospel message to other generations, it's no wonder why the world is in the state that it's in. You know, I looked at, at Nineveh, and I looked at the book of Nahum, and Nineveh in the light of what, where they're at now, and I thought, huh, that's really interesting. Because everywhere you go where the gospel is proclaimed, if you don't keep it up, what happens? People go back to what is bad. You know, you don't have to teach a child what is bad. Mm. You don't have to teach a child to do the wrong thing. You have to teach a child to do the right thing. And the same with uh, the new generations. Every new generation needs the gospel. Yeah. And if they don't, I'll just go back to doing what is natural. You know, doing what is godly is seldom what is natural. It's not. And we are more than likely willing to go back, as the Bible says, back to the vomit <laughs> than we are to follow after Christ. And his vengeance, although it may seem excessive, is only the result of a fierce rejection. You know, when God carries out his judgment, it is only after allowing for his grace to flow first. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to the next point, that God is good. You know, although this passage, and if you were to read all of Nahum, really in its entirety, it's three chapters, it's not that long. It's kind of nestled right there neatly between Habakkuk and the book of Micah. It is a great story because it shows God's goodness provided, and it shows the rejection of God's goodness, and then the punishment of the rejection, the result, the consequence. That's really what it is if you were to take all three. The only reason why I'm not delving so much into two and three is because that's just, okay, and, and this king came in and then utterly wiped the city, and then chapter three is all about the looting of Nineveh. Um, and what you see, if you look at all three chapters and you take kind of a bird's eye view of it, is this. God gives them salvation in Jonah. God then reminds them in Nahum chapter 1, this is God's grace. Chapter 2, you rejected. Here's the consequence. Number 3, you still reject me. Guess what? I will leave you utterly desolate. Very similar to what I was preaching when I preached on the Hell series, where that is the choice that is given to all people, is that we have a choice and it is extended to us. God's grace is extended to each and every person. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And we have rejected him. People have rejected him. And that rejection only takes so long that God finally says, You know what? Enough is enough. And that's what we see here in the book of Nahum. But God is good, and he gives goodness in the midst of his anger. Remember, Nineveh, as I mentioned, and I'll mention again, had already been marked for judgment once. God set his eyes on Nineveh and told Mr. Fishman <laughs> to go and to proclaim the gospel because soon, if they did not repent... They were going to get wiped off of the face of the planet. John chapter 1 verse 2. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. And this coming of God's message made for the salvation of the city. And I love this because this is the king of Nineveh here. He's, he, this is what he says. Jonah chapter 3. This is better than what some of the people of God were saying at this time. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perisheth not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did not. Here we see it went up to the king in Jonah. The message of God's wrath coming and God's grace provided had gotten up to the king, and he said this, we're going to do good, and if God decides to wipe us off the map, he is right to do so but we're going to do good anyway. That's faith. Yep. And that's faith from somebody that was a pagan that, sh that did not know any better, but he, when he was face down with the glory and the mighty justice of God, said, you know what? Yeah, we've, we've messed up. 
We've done wrong. And you know what? If God decides that it's over for Nineveh, okay, it's over for Nineveh, but we're still going to do what God has commanded us to do. So now, in Nahum, he is speaking to a Nineveh who had already come to know the truth. And what he does is this. He reminds Nineveh of God's goodness. I'll read two verses for you, three and then seven of Nahum chapter one. He says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and he will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the, will, in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trusts in him. God offers grace to everyone who will take it, including the wicked people of Nineveh. It doesn't matter how evil you think you are, God's grace is not beyond your reach. And his reach is not beyond you. He offers grace to Nineveh before and reminds through Nahum that same grace that he extended back in the days of Jonah because as much as God is a judge, he is a good judge. He is a good judge and he's still that same good judge today. Because honestly, we should all be marked for condemnation. We should all be on our way to hell save for one person, Jesus Christ. All of us should be justly so because we have all wronged god remember there for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god there is no one more unrighteous in nineveh than we were all at one point there is no one more wicked in nineveh than what we were before jesus christ nineveh is no different than anyone else even though we know they're famous for being such a wicked and indulgent city for those that repent he is a refuge in the day of judgment god preserves the righteous even through the judgment and even though the ninevites as a people had rejected god he was sure to tell them even though as a whole you've rejected god if you've received me and if you have come to know me i will be your stronghold i will protect you you know, not all of Israel respected God. And as we get closer and closer to the New Testament, we see that less people actually followed after God. Most kings, remember, they would turn against the prophets that God had provided for them. But there was still a remnant that said, no, we're going to do what's right. We're mm -hmm. going to do what's right because God says it, and that's good enough for me. And he gives the same protection here to the Ninevites that said, you know what? Yeah, we sinned and we need to repent. To them, he says, I will be a stronghold in the day of judgment. Lastly, I want to turn your attention to one verse, and really I think it's at the end of your outline. I put three verses um, kind of back to back. At the end of Nahum chapter 1, here's what it says. It says, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. And I put two other verses there. I'll read them for you. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7 says, Oh, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, the Lord reigneth. Mm -hmm. And then Romans 10, 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is, beautiful, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Amen. You know, these three passages teach us one thing. It doesn't matter if it's in the Old Testament or if it's in the, if it's in the New Testament. It's important to tell people about God. It's important to tell people and present the gospel to every creature. For Nineveh, just as in the rest of the world, the answer is this, preaching the gospel to them. And God was gracious enough to send to Nineveh Jonah and then Nahum to remind them God is still good and there is still time. We know if you were to go on to Nahum and later on in the book, they did not turn as a whole. There wasn't the citywide uh, revival that Jonah got to see and was very bitter about it. But they did not get that a second time. This time, they just were so set in their ways, they just said, eh, whatever. 
and God brought in an army and absolutely wiped them off the face of the planet. Didn't do it by fire and brimstone. He brought a competing army and wiped them off the face of the planet, left them desolate. And there's actually, a, um, if you read, uh, there's a poem that was written about the fall of Nineveh. It's a beautiful poem. It's not, it's not in the Bible. It's, it's an extra, you know, historical thing. And, I mean, it's so beautiful and so detailed, but it's really long, so I didn't want to bring it to you. But if you have a chance, look it up. And look up. It's The Fall of Nineveh. It's a poem. And it is gorgeous. I mean, just in the, the beauty of how everything is described. It's, it's, it's horrific, too, but um, just in how everything is described. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, the world needs preachers whose feet are made beautiful with the gospel. With the good news and the good tidings of God's grace. You know, all of us should be like Nahum instead of like Jonah. You know, Nahum did exactly what God called him to do. More often than not, and I found myself in this position, I find myself being more like Jonah. You know, try to do our own thing. And God has to know, I told you to do this, go do this. We should be on fire to bring sinners to repentance, knowing that one day God will judge the wicked and make things right. For the righteous in Nineveh, there was a hope. And the hope was this, that their righteousness would not go unnoticed. That God was going to protect them and be a stronghold for them in the day of trouble. And that is the promise that he makes to everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord. Let's pray together. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for your word. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness. And I pray that you will please be with us as we go. I thank you for these great passages of Nahum and Jonah and how you extended grace to a city that for all accounts worldly speaking did not deserve grace but we were all at one point in that same place. God I pray that you be with us. Lord I pray that you will give us the opportunities, give us the willpower, give us the just the, the power, Lord, from your spirit to go and to proclaim the gospel to every creature. And God, I pray, Lord, that you be with us as we finish out this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Stand with us and turn to 276.